Uh, hello, this is uh, Debbie Stein. I'm Associate Director of the Ska Institute for Energy Innovation. Um, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our uh, webcast on robotic airboat water quality monitoring. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting new technology that we have here at uh, Carnegie Mellon. If you have any questions, uh, please type them in now so that uh, we can answer them at the end of the broadcast. Uh, I'd also like to make sure you know that the event is being um, broadcast uh, live as well as being recorded and the results will go up on YouTube and the Scott Institute uh, webpage. The Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at uh, Carnegie Mellon is focused on using and delivering the energy we already have more efficiently expanding the mix of energy sources in a way that is clean, reliable, affordable, and sustainable, and creating innovations in energy technologies, regulations, and policies. Catalyst Connection is an economic development organization dedicated to helping small manufacturers in southwestern Pennsylvania improve their competitive uh, performance. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Scarry, who is the president of Platypus LLC. Uh, until recently, he was associate professor at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute, and his research looks at large teams of software agents and robots doing complex tasks, tasks in the field. Over the past 15 years, he's built robotic teams ranging from soccer playing robots to unmanned air vehicles for managing cattle. He's originally from Australia, and he did his PhD in Sweden uh, before coming to the United States in 2001. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn over to Paul to tell more about his technology. Thanks, Debbie, and thanks for the chance to tell you a little bit about what we're um, doing at Platypus. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, how we collect um, water data at very low cost using cheap, reliable, and, and small robots. I want to talk a little bit about how um, people, uh, manufacturers and others can work with us and, and some of the things we're doing. I'll tell you a little bit about the data that we collect and, and at the end I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the technology that we use to get this data. The concept that we, we've got here at Platypus is that we can build these very small, about three foot long, lightweight, autonomous robots that are capable of collecting large amounts of information in a body of inland water with minimal human oversight. Um, Depending on exactly how it's done currently, um, we, our autonomous boats can collect data at maybe up to a thousandth of the current costs. Um, in addition to this dramatic cost reduction, we get the safety, repeatability, reliability, and, and simplic simplicity of using robots versus having to, to go and put people out in the water um, with a sensor to understand what's going on. Um, here's a, just a little bit of a view um, of a couple of our boats uh, a couple of years ago on a fish farm. Um, in, uh, in Ohio. They're out there collecting data about the oxygen levels and the temperature of the water so that the farmer can understand um, the context of the water. This particular farmer had a single sensor in the water um, and so he knew about one corner of the water but our boats were able to give him a lot more information. And you can see my engineer sitting on the side of the river quite relaxing while the boats go and do all the work. Um, the basic concept when, when you're using platypus robots to do water is you go down to the river, um, you pull the boat out of the back of your, uh, your car, it only weighs 20 pounds and three feet long, five or so minutes you've got the boat in the water, you go back to your Android tablet or your, or your laptop computer and you say, I want this area searched, you indicate that on the map, and then you sit back and relax like uh, my students were doing, so that the, and let one or more robots go out and collect um, data from that area before they come back and let you go home. If you're in a um, patch of water that's particularly um, complex or you have very specific requirements, then you can take over more control of the robots and uh, work out what's going on or, or control exactly what they do and where they do it. Um, so, we, as I said, we have uh, a couple of standard boats that are about three foot long, but our, our technology goes really in any um, form factor. So, at the, in the bottom left here, we, we're showing our airboat. Um, has a, an above water fan that allows us to, to really not impact the water. So if you've got sensitive water or there's weeds in it or you don't want to stir the water up or you've got a liner in a frack water pond, you can use an airboat. On the right hand side is a little bit more efficient, a little bit more traditional boat design. The top right we've got a winch that we can drop a sensor down up to 100 feet deep or even a big 9 foot catamaran if you want to carry a very big payload out in the water. 
all using the same basic autonomous uh, robotic technology. Um, so what this means is we can, we can go and um, get into a lot of markets, and we already have that the list on the right-hand side there is uh, markets that people have brought to us, which has been one of the most fun things about this project, all the, the things that we need to know about water that we didn't know about. Some of our markets are, uh, are where people are already collecting water um, for, for legal um, or commercial reasons. You want to know, you, you have to survey for the um, EPA, or you want to do it to show that you're not impacting the water. But we also think there's a lot of markets out there where people aren't currently collecting information about water, but there's real value in that. Lake management companies, for example, that have to work with a lake without really understanding a lot about what's going on, or uh, sewer management where you can't get into the, you don't understand fully what's going on in the sewer. And of course, you know, when, you, when you, people are coming to you with interesting things, sometimes we get real out of the blue ones. Um, this was a great fun one where we got to go down to Kenya disguise our robot as a, uh, as a crocodile and send it into a, a river full of hippopotamuses. This is clearly, this was something that the researchers could never do before. They could never actually understand what was in this water, how the hippopotamuses were affecting this very complex e ecosystem, but by just dropping this robot in um, and, and letting it drive around, we could go and collect um, some unprecedented data and, uh, and get sort of closer to hippopotamuses than you would ever want to if you were a person. Um, so this was also a good test of, of how robust and reliable that technology was. If you can go into the Mara um, in the middle of Africa and, and run your robots for two weeks and then let biologists take them back for another three months and work on their own, we know we've reached a, a level of maturity of your technology. Um, so Platypus is then a data company. What we do is we get data to, to customers um, better and cheaper than, than has been possible before. Um, if equipped with four sensors, we can collect something like 10,000 data points in an hour. So it gives you an unprecedented look at a body of water. Previously, we might have collected by hand three or four measurements and tried to interpolate what's going on in the rest of the water. Um, you know, and now for 100 bucks, we can we can go out and tell you, give you uh, you know 10,000 data points about an acre and really understand that. Um, as much as we're a data company, we're starting to be very interested in, in working with um, service providers who can train. Um, their own operators to go out and do things and, and, and later one of the, the concepts we have is to to give boats away to free um, to, to companies that might be interested in this and charge them on a per use basis to bring down the risk. We can do that because we've built a cheap and um, simple enough robot. Um, we got there, um, we've, we've got a, a lot of interesting partners over time, this is a, a, a short list of some of the people we've worked with. Um, about $2 million worth of funding has gone into making these robots work. Um, a bunch of uh, Robotics Institute faculty, there's multiple PhD theses coming out of it. Um, countless hours of, of our time, and, and really importantly, that we're, when we're building cheap and simple robots, we've been able to get thousands of hours on the water to, to make this work. And of course, it leverages so much of the technology that the Robotics Institute has, has developed over 20 years that goes into building a robot like this. We're really interested in, in, uh, in currently um, getting our boats manufactured so we can get them out there. Um, we still think if, if we can take the current manufacturing cost, which is about two two and $2,500, and we could divide that again, a whole bunch of new interesting markets open up. We're also interested in, in developing other platforms for different um, water, and, and maybe there's partners out there that, that either know how to do that or have an interest. We're also interested in finding partners with domain knowledge. Um, we were contacted by an algae collection company and a sewer company recently to say, could your technology be used for this? Let's help you, um, you know, uh, tune it to, to work in these domains. And we're really interested in finding people that can do that. Um, this is what we, we currently collect at the moment. Pretty much anything that you can, you can digitally measure with, with water, which is not everything, but it's a bunch of stuff, then we can typically connect that sensor up to our boat and stream it off the boat live back to, back to the, the user. Um, here's some examples. We've got uh, vegetation, um, so we can understand the weeds or, or other things if, you're, if you need to, to fix a lake or understand how much water's there. Um, bathymetry, making detailed maps of, of the contours of the bottom of a, of a river or a lake. Um, on the, the right hand side there you've got the actual um, sonar image from the bottom so we can see um, uh, residue buildup on the bottom of the lake. 
Um, we can measure things that are important for the health of, of water. Um, this is dissolved oxygen um, in Crooked Creek Reservoir, showing how that varies over even a fairly small area, depending on exactly where the weeds were, the direction of the sun, we get quite a, a big variation. In the same area then, the electrical conductivity, the salinity or a, a basic measure of pollution uh, varied, temperature varied in, in a similar way. So you really get this new insight into, into what um, the quality and, and what's going on in the water. Recently we've been working a lot with side scan sonar. This is a very high resolution picture of part of the bottom of the, the Mon River. So you can really get an idea of, of what's going on, on on the bottom of the river. Our archaeologist has marked there on the left hand side the concrete revertments in the in the bank of the river there, um, sort of showing the level of detail that we can get. And you can see individual rocks on the on the right hand side of that image. Where are we going to next? As I said, uh, bathymetry for, for surveying, um, for search and rescue is, is a big push. We're partnering with Navico that's building some, some low cost um, bathymetry equipment and the uh, engineers at Michael Baker International that uh, have the, the domain expertise to do this. We're really excited about a, a service we're going to provide robots to free for free to lake managers, let them use it and then charge them when they collect data. This dramatically lowers the, you know, the um, cost of entry for these um, users. We're doing, working a lot with universities all around the world, um, recently contacted by Accenture Japan to, to try to set up an education program over there. A lot of interest in China as, as pollution becomes a big issue over there and we look to have some stuff going on. We're really excited about working with the EPA to try to, to, make, uh, to certify our data so that opens up all those markets where we need um, certified data for legal reasons. Um, one of the things I do in my research is to, is to build teams of robots that work together. So we're adapting a lot of our algorithms that we, we built for the military to put fleets of robots out. Um, next week we're going to have um, 25 robots working together in the water in Doha. We'll make that video available. And this allows you to very quickly cover an area either with diverse sensors or just very quickly if you've got some spatially um, and temporally interesting phenomena going on. Um, and we're continuing to research, talking to NSF about supporting that research. This is the new surveying boat we're putting together to do higher quality bathymetry stuff, hopefully get into um, you know, actual engineering applications with this boat. This is being designed in consultation with engineering companies that work with, uh, with oil companies in the area. And we're even building a blimp using the same technology, put out same intelligence, same um, AI, but, but raise a air sensor up above, say, a fracking site to measure methane output from the, frac, from the fracking. Just a, a quick word on, on our company. We spun out of CMU in 2012. We're fully owned by, uh, partly by CMU and the rest by the founders. We have yet to take uh, venture cap. We're based in Pittsburgh down on the river so we can get easy access to the river. We're doing everything locally. We're working with Made in America to, to help with our um, manufacturing and training. And as much as we're, we're, we're really taking out, we've got a bunch of people that have got a lot of research experience, so we're staying on the cutting edge, but we really want to make this technology work. So we're trying to, to balance those two things. Um, so with that, I, I'll take any questions. These are my contact details. We're always excited to hear about um, any, any new opportunities or partners in, in different domains. Thank you. Great. Um, Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, very uh, interesting presentation. Um, so uh, here's a number of uh, questions for you. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, bathymetry, mm -hmm. uh, exactly how it works, and um, you know how it relates to like GPS systems, mm -hmm. and uh, then we'll sort of start from there. Yeah. So typically, when you want to measure the or, or map the bottom of some body of water, you use some sort of sonar, and until fairly recently, these were very expensive and very heavy systems. Companies like Navico, with who we're partnering, have, have dramatically um, reduced the cost and weight of some of those systems. Um, these are essentially very high-end fish finders nowadays, and you use a sonar beam to, to map the bottom of what's going on you, by just listening to the reflection of what's going on. Um, you couple that with GPS, you take a whole lot of readings, you put that into a piece of software, and then you get a pretty map of what's going on on the bottom of the water. Mm -hmm. As I talked uh, briefly there about our new surveying boat, that's to take that one level of, of fidelity higher again. Um, for surveying applications, for example, around a, a lock or a dam, we need survey grade um, 
equipment survey grade uh, sonar. So we're, we're working on uh, building a boat that's capable of taking those very high quality GPS receivers so we get very accurate um, localization, coupling that with um, high end sonar and really making a good map. So what we've got at the moment is something that very, very quickly and very cheaply gives you a pretty good picture of what's on the bottom of the water. Um, and in the next sort of six months to a year, we'll get that to engineering grade um, level of mapping. Mm -hmm. And and so it it goes it collects do they collect water samples is it you know just on the surface you know it does do it at various depths can you talk more about that yeah so a lot of what we do is collecting water on on the top we we have our sensor you know attached somehow to the side of the boat and just collect water uh, collecting information about the top um, however we have developed a a winch system that allows us to lower a sensor um, as low as a hundred feet down into the water and we can collect um, information about water. Um, way down near the bottom. We also have an ability, the advantage of a robot is you can go and collect thousands of samples by, by digitally measuring them. But in some cases you do want to take a physical sample back to a lab for more analysis. And we have got some uh, ability to grab a sample. Um, at the moment that's only grabbing a sample from the surface, but, but hopefully over the summer that'll extend and we'll be able to grab a sample from any depth. The, the concept there is that we can go out and take a whole bunch of digital measurements the user can be watching this data stream and say, I, I would really like a, a, a grab sample from there to take back to the lab and, and understand what's going on. Uh, so what kind of uh, data do you collect? Do, in what forms does it come out? Are there physical, oh, I guess I already kind of asked this a little bit about physical samples, but like other kinds of samples besides water. Yes, I mean, so, we, so we're always taking digital samples um, where, uh, Temperature, oxygen, electric conductivity, uh, specific conductivity. Um, we're working with a few uh, vendors that are making some interesting sensors where we're actually going to share an office with a company that's making a um, bromide sensor um, uh, that, that will fit on the boat and uh, allow us to measure that. There's some emerging heavy metal sensors that we're going we're gonna to hook up. Um, basically think of any digital sensor that you can stick into a glass of water and get a reading. We can typically put that on a boat and get the same data and stream that data over time. Okay. And uh, you talked about like loaning out the boats, but like say we wanted to buy a boat for our own purposes mm -hmm. and maybe you know collect our own data um, and and so forth. So what skills do our personnel need to have you know for that uh, activity and and how how would that that uh, method work. Yeah. So we, we do do that. We, we don't always encourage it. We, we can sometimes get better data from the, the boat just because we've, we've had some experience with this um, instead of users. But we do, we do sell boats and some universities have had some real, really nice success taking our boats and deploying themselves. The skill level is fairly low. We're, we're really trying to drag that down. Um, typically you go and turn the boat on, you go to your Android tablet, you make sure that tablet connects up to the boat and then you follow a fairly simple user interface um, that, that allows you to control that boat. Um, so the, the technical skill when everything goes smoothly and well is, is actually very low. I, I showed a picture up there where we had a seven-year-old from the Philippines actually deploy and control a boat when we were over there a few years back. Um, it's, it's robotics. Um, it's like like any technical piece of equipment. Um, you know, there's some challenges when you get into difficult environments or, or maintenance that we, we have haven't got as smooth as we would as we'd like to but as we go through this manufacturing process um, we'll, we'll hope to, to really improve that and in the next year or so we'll make it really a very genuine thing that someone could sort of buy um, at the moment we're sort of pricing them you know under ten thousand dollars so it's, it's a reasonable thing for, for a lot of projects and, and really take this out and, and use them uh, so you know, can I go and start the boats running, go off and have lunch, then come back, or do I have to like be there when the boat's there and you know doing the monitoring? And um, you know, how long does it take? You know, like yeah. you know, like how long does the actual operation itself take? Yeah, that's a good question. So most of the time, certainly when we're working with it, we we stay in the vicinity. We like to smile and say that we would go on and have lunch, but we usually hang around to watch. You're not, you don't have to interact with the boat. So once it's out running, if you've got confidence the area is safe, you don't have to worry about a speedboat coming in and intentionally knocking you over, then you can go and have lunch. Um, for, for many sampling applications, you, you want to move fairly slowly in the water. This is where, whether you're a manned 
vehicle taking uh, samples by hand or whether you're a robot. So we typically move um, our boats sort of in, in an order of about two or three miles an hour. Um, so when you want to sample a patch of water, it depends on the density of, of the samples you want to take, how big the water is. Um, we say an acre at, at an interesting density that would give you a really good idea of what's going on in that acre of water takes about 20 minutes. Okay, and um, let's uh, switch to the sort of blimp technology. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not quite sure if I understand how, you know, the robots and uh, aspect of it, I guess, on land work with the blimp. Do the, I don't know, right. robots go around and, you know, tell me, tell me more about how that right. works. So this is sort of gets a little bit, you know, when we're engineers and we realize that our core technology is this AI for autonomy, it's user interfaces, and, it, and it's the simplicity of connecting up to sensors. So the blimp has nothing to do with a boat. It's a, it's a, a balloon, a methane balloon that can stay aloft for a week without any maintenance that we can autonomously raise or lower to look at, at uh, air at different heights. Um, instead of putting water sensors on it to measure you know, the oxygen level in the water, we put air sensors on it, methane sensors or other pollution sensors. And then we go and um, the, the initial target here is to go to fracking sites where we're worried about methane releases, have a methane sensor, and then autonomously raise and lower this balloon over the course of a week, refill it, do another week, and get really um, unprecedented information about methane releases from, from fracking sites. We're about to test this at a, at a compost, at a, you know, a residential uh, refuse site where there's a lot of methane coming off biological matter to, just to understand and show the quality of the models and then take it out hopefully to a, to a fracking site. And then we can, we can start to provide some hard data into these discussions about whether fracking is re resulting in a lot of methane coming out or not, which is currently a, an argument that no one really has data to support. Um, yeah, so before we were talking about, um, you know, collecting, you know, water samples from bathymetry and that you could do at different surfaces, mm -hmm. uh, not just at the surface, but below and also at different uh, depths. So with, with air, uh, it sounds like it's, it's somewhat of the same thing, but can mm -hmm. you do it um, longitudinally? So, for example, a lot of the concern with methane is for pipeline leaks, right? right? So you might want to, like, have the, um, the balloon, you know, go a, a certain amount of distance, um, you know, along, as opposed to just go above a site, mm -hmm. uh, also go, like, longitudinally. Can yeah. you do that sort of thing? So we, we cannot do that, and... and um, one of the reasons for using a tethered blimp um, is to, to basically avoid the FAA. Um, working with unmanned air vehicles, something I've, I've done plenty of time in research, uh, is very difficult commercially. Getting through the FAA to, do, um, to get certification to fly is very difficult. We, we certainly know how to do that, but the, the regulatory hurdles are just, are just too high. What we do to handle the longitudinal thing, we can build this blimp cheaply enough that deploying four or eight or 12 of them um, to, to get some spatial measure of what's going on um, is feasible. So that, that's essentially the idea we have now, that we would, we would position these around a fracking site, um, potentially taking into account prevailing winds. And then so since you've got multiple sensors and you can raise and lower them um, vertically, you've got some ability to, to build a, a 3D model of what's going on. It's, it's imperfect, and we prefer to do it with UAVs, but we need to, to wait until the FAA um, makes that a little bit more uh, possible. Um, and you, you talked about, uh, going back to the water uh, aspects, about some um, uh, Department of Defense activities that are also related to water and different temperatures and things like that. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit more about what that purpose might be and those, those uh, interactions? <coughs> Um, so the defense stuff is more related to um, uh, either security, fleet security, um, and research applications, um, rather than particularly caring about the water. Um, talking to the fleet over in Bahrain um, a couple of months ago, they're really concerned about uh, you know vehicles that are coming up to their destroyers, um, and they need a, a, a sort of um, a defensive system of, of fleets of robots. Um, our robots aren't particularly designed for that. I mean, we have some of the technology, and we're looking at working with, with um, research groups like the Office of Naval Research to use our platform as a, as a test case 
for how c some of this could be done. If you're worried about fishing boats actually being um, suicide bombers and going to hit one of your patrol ships, how can we look after a, a, a defensive perimeter? With similar cases, um, similar discussions with people like the Department of Homeland Security, using the side scan sonar to say look for mines in um, ports. Uh, there's a, a, a scenario that they're concerned about in Pittsburgh where someone could place a bomb under a bridge in the water, it's very difficult to find, and then ask for ransom. Um, and then potentially robotic boats are a very good way of going and, and detecting that bomb um, reasonably quickly and safely. And so for, uh, let's just take an example of industry. So if you were saying the petrochemical industry, um, and you know, what are the different ways that, that you could use a, use a platypus device, uh, mm -hmm. the boats, to, to do different things? So there's a whole variety, and it's been fascinating talking to um, you know, Console and some of their contractors that do their work. Um, one of the, the interesting ones we're, we're working with with um, the National Energy Technology Labs is if frack water ponds, um, lined ponds, they don't want to get people anywhere near that, so they start to lose track of what's going on in the water, sediment buildup. One of the really exciting things we found there is that you get a lot of stratification of the salt in those frack water ponds, which makes it hard to reuse for fracking. Um, and they spend a lot of money and energy mixing those ponds to get a consistent salinity. Um, we're developing some technology that would allow us to go and map that pond in real time and say, this strata that's 11 feet below the water surface has the level of salinity that you, that you need. So rather than mixing the whole pond, just pull your, your frack water from there. Um, so uh, those sorts of random things turned up. The last time we were out at console, they said to us, hey, we just found we've got a lake that we didn't know we had on one of our properties. We have no idea how much water's in it. We know, have no idea of the quality of that water. Is this something you could go and look at? And, and of course, it's something we're very well suited to looking at. Okay. And, and at what depths below the surface uh, can samples be collected? So typical, one way of doing it is just collecting off the sample. Our winch system, we've tested it down to 100 feet. Um, one of our customers at the University of Michigan um, it changed the cable on our on our uh, on our winch and was able to go lower um, using some Kevlar covered cable and I think that was an interesting thing. We're working with them to see if we can integrate that. Um, you, we want to be tethered to that sensor, so it, it's sort of the the length safe length of a tether. Um, certainly, most of the lakes in in this area in in the Pittsburgh area, we're fine with. Um, things like Lake Erie and so on, there, there is better suited technology like underwater uh, vehicles that will actually go down to those depths rather than trying to drop a sensor in from the top. So can you do, you know, like say do it at 10 feet, 25, mm -hmm. 50, 100 all in one sample run? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's very much what, what the group was doing in Kenya. Um, they had had a little bit of an ability to, to sample the surface water if they were careful and had a, had a ranger watching out for hippos, but they had absolutely no idea what was going under the water, on under the water. So there we were doing runs through these hippo filled ponds with the sensor at 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, so they could build a, a 3D model of what was going on with, with oxygen and, and other things in that water, um, helped them to understand why fish kills were occurring. Um, way downstream after rainstorms. Okay. And uh, while we're talking about competition, like you know, how are you different from your competitors? Yeah, it's it's um, interesting. There's there's a lot of interesting competitors. This is a nice um, domain for um, for robotics. Um, what we've really targeted is going the low cost end. There's some fascinating companies like Liquid Robotics that's building a an ocean going, very long duration. Um, information collecting device. Um, it's sort of a you know half million dollar robot um, that you know needs waves and so on to move. Um, it's not really suited for where we are. We're building a five thousand dollar robot that you can take to a pond, deploy in twenty minutes with a, any old technician, and get out of there. So we're really targeting. With our engineering effort has really been dedicated into making this simple, making this cheap. A lot of our, our competitors, some of which we, we work with and we talk to a lot, um, are building very high-end devices. And there's, if you're going to search for the, the Malaysia Airlines flight off the, off the coast of Australia, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's very good, expensive robots that will do that. If you want to know how much water is your, on your golf course pond to know how much chemicals to put in it, then you need a, a platypus, not a liquid robotics robot. 
Uh, and exactly, where is your technology in its uh, innovation cycle? So we we've got a bunch of customers. We're going out. Um, our customers are mostly happy. We're we're still working through issues. Um, we go and do commercial projects all the time. Um, so we we are you know, robotics engineers, largely at a company. So there's always development. This latest iteration that we finished about uh, about six months ago is the first one that we've really attempted to manufacture at scale. So it's the it's the first time we really think we've got a product that that is worth. Um, you know, going through the manufacturing process for. So that's the one that we're putting 25 in the water at once in Doha under the control of two operators. You can only get to the sort of that level of, of fleet scale if your reliability and simplicity has got to a, a reasonable level. So, um, you know, we, we think we've got something that's, that's operationally useful. We're going to keep pushing that. Um, we're probably not quite ready to just hand this out to, to any old tech with no... Uh, no background at all in, in robotics and, and just expect them to use it every day. But, but we hope to get there in the next six months to a year. And can you sort of summarize both the primary benefits and the primary challenges uh, that remain for using this technology? Mm -hmm. the, benefits, the, the benefit that we always aim for is, is cost. That, that is just too compl it's too expensive to collect va the information that is valuable about water. But as a side effect, you, you get a whole bunch of things like safety. There's a lot of water we don't want to go in, and not just because there's a bunch of hippopotamuses in there. Um, you get the reliability of robotics that you can do repeat things over and over again. Um, hand sampling is much less reliable. Um, we get, uh, because you can put multiple robots out, we, we increase the speed at which things can be done. Because we can put multiple sensors on a single boat and then different sets of sensors on another boat, we can also collect a bigger variety of information um, than can currently be connected, collected. Um, challenges is still, um, when you, whenever you're talking about robotics and, and people are sort of comfortable with this, edge cases and complicated issues and, and you know, getting safely under a jetty or, or navigating some very sensitive water or doing things. There are, there are certain cases, edge cases, where people are still, you know, very important um, that they really need to, to be involved, um, dealing with, you know, heavy, heavy currents or, or other challenges. So it's, it's a robot, and, and when the environment's good and, and we're expanding what the, that means, then we do well. Um, but there are certainly cases where, you know, you want a human in the loop. Um, I think the other big challenge um, is that uh, humans have a, have a that, that work with water collect, information collection have a very good feeling for when things are wrong, when things are interesting, um, when we want to collect more information. Um, we've got a, an ongoing PhD project to try to build that ability into the robot to say, yeah, this is interesting, collect more information here, something's going wrong. Or, or, or something that your sense is broken. We, you know, that, that there's something wrong. Go back. Um, so that you know, it, you're still dealing with a robot, and it has its limitations. That where people are good, but I think you know, we're, we're certainly getting to the point where the, the technology, that the, the benefits outweigh the, the weaknesses at the moment. Okay. Uh, speaking of that, I, several times you said AI. I presume AI means artificial, artificial intelligence. intelligence. Sorry, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just want just to make sure that uh, everybody knew what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, what kind of companies are you working with now? Are they big companies, little companies? You know, from what sectors? Can you give an overview? Yeah. So, our, uh, I think nearly all of our sales of boats have gone to universities, and that's been intentional. We we haven't encouraged anybody else to buy. We've actively discouraged it. Um, in terms of uh, our initial customers, um, because it was such a, a big change for them, we're all environmental groups. Um, Getting that ability to understand uh, you know, water and, and collect information on water for public use or for their own use um, that they didn't have before. Um, as we've sort of matured the technology and gone along, we're starting to, to work much more with, um, with engineering and other service companies. Um, we're trying to do a lot with um, one of consoles, uh, with consoles blessing, one of their big biggest uh, service providers so that at the company that they use to look after a lot of their water is going to start using our technology to collect a lot of the information they do. Um, lake management companies in the, in the same um, phenomena that you, know, you, you get interesting examples like 
you know they they have to, they go and estimate the the size of a, the amount the volume of water and the and the amount of vegetation in a pond, throw amount of uh, pesticides in that they think makes sense, but if they'd actually known the the volume of the pond correctly, they could have saved three hundred dollars worth of pesticides and and actually been much healthier for the environment. So. Um, Really, engineering companies at the moment and service providers like lake managers or, or service providers to, to companies like Consul. And what kind of partners are you looking for now? Yeah, so we said so one of the things that we're interested in doing is is starting to manufacture, um, you know, a, a wider variety of boats. We still think if we could if we could drop price our production price down to the five hundred dollar range, and I think that's going to be difficult. But if we could do that. New markets open up where maybe maybe still a five thousand dollar robot doesn't make sense, but a thousand dollar robot is a feasible thing to do. But as much as anything, we're really looking for for partners that will help us into some of those domains that that I listed early on. We get a lot of people coming to us and saying your technology would be great for this or great for that, and and we agree and we're excited about it. As a small company, we can't go and chase all these things. Um, we are going into to bathymetry at the moment and looking at that surveying side because we found three companies willing to partner with us to provide a lot of the domain knowledge, to provide um, good examples, to provide ground truth data to compare against. And that's been really important um, in making that market um, much better. So um, partners like that that could say, hey, we have a, a, a sewer company walked into us the other day and said, you know, we'd love to help you you make this work for sewers and, and we're starting that partnership. So those sorts of partners that can say, look, we know a domain, we know a market, we have a real need, we will help you get into this into this domain and we'll share the rewards of that. Um, that's the sort of thing we're, we're extra excited about talking to. Okay, can you talk, uh, I know you talked a little bit about cost, but maybe you can give an overview from sort of like the different kind of like cost-related issues mm -hmm. from, you know, everything from just like, a, you, you know, giving the boats for free to yep. people buying it and so forth. Yeah, so our latest our latest boats uh, um, appear to have, as, as best we can sort of calculate it um, at some sort of scale, about $1,200 worth of parts in them take about a day to put together, a day of labor to put together. So that's where we get our, you know, approximately $2,000 costs and we put some sensors on it. Some of the sensors like the, the bathymetry sensors are, are quite expensive. Some of the water monitoring for, you know, pollution monitoring, oxygen monitoring are much cheaper. And that's where we get to the sort of, you know, $3,000 or so um, range for, for building the boat. Once we've built it, though, the, the running costs are, are, are very low. Um, this is a fully electric boat, so we can plug it in and, and, and charge it overnight. Um, because you're using all electric motors and electric sensors, the reliability is you know, fairly good. There's not a lot of maintenance to be done on it. So when we you know, talk about being able to survey a, a lake for $100, it's essentially our time of, of driving to the lake, putting the boat in the water, 20 minutes of surveying, and drive home. Um, the robot's still in in perfectly good shape. We've cost you know, no material costs and so on. So, and, you know that's that's where we get that ballpark. Um, it's one of the reasons why we think this idea of giving boats away to f for free to someone makes sense. If you're a lake management company, you're not quite sure whether robotics are for you, whether platypus is for you. Um, if we can if we can be producing these robots for two thousand dollars, we can ship it down to you. Um, that you go and say, ah, yes, I, today I have a need for this robot. We collect it. The data gets automatically sent back to us. We process the data, send you a, a PDF file, and you know, charge you $200 for it. Um, in that way, we think there's a good economic model for us. The company needs to use it you know, 10 or 20 times um, in order for us to, to get our, our, um, our, uh, development, our construction cost back, not our development costs. Um, but but there's there's a very low bar on the on the lake management company. So if they if they find a use where they can gain two hundred dollars by knowing how much water or how much vegetation or how much oxygen is in this pond, um, and then they can use it. So we think there's a good model good model there um, for people like Consol that that you know find a lake they don't know of uh, they didn't know about before. Um, they say to them that water is potentially worth hundreds of thousands of dollars if they if they understand it well. Um, and so there, you know, it's a little bit of a different model. We can work with them to, to, to really understand that water, understand it in 3D, understand it over time and space, and allow them to get the best value out of that. 
water. Um, so we're coming to the last of our questions. So for our audience out there, please uh, send any last questions you have before we uh, close shop here. Um, so um, what funding agencies do you work with now? So we, uh, our initial funding came from um, Venture Cap, where um, Qatar National Research Fund, which is great, Carnegie Mellon has a, has a campus over there. They gave us a, a big injection of funding um, to do this. We're currently working um, with ONR, uh, the Office of Naval Research, NSF, the National Science Foundation, and a few others. We don't yet have funding through them, but we, we are expecting to in the next um, period of time. We've worked with local incubators. Um, we got some money from Google at one point. Um, so it is, there's a variety as we go into different things. Um, some of our funding, um, so for example, the Naval Research, is to more use our platform as a, as a research tool, um, whereas Innovation Works was really to, to look at how we get data to customers. So depending on exactly how we're using the robot, um, different funding sources make sense. Okay. And um, let me see. Oh, one second. Um, although uh, n not always an issue, um, are the uh, analytical results accepted by the EPA? No, and uh, that is something we're actively working on. So um, everybody, EPA, uh, the people that use EPA data and us all believe that they should be. Um, it's an interesting, an interesting problem that we're dealing with. The, the rules that the EPA currently has are written so that... Uh, information for EPA uh, regulatory issues needs to be collected by hand in a certain way. Um, EPA has been fantastic in saying that this is not appropriate and that we need to be able to certify robots for this, um, for this sort of thing. They see the benefits. The people that have to deliver data to the EPA see the benefits. Um, it's, it's a slow process. We are actively working with the EPA. I'm meeting again with the EPA um, next week to, to move the next step of this forward. Um, and we're very active, you know, really want to make that happen. We think that's a big deal. And what about the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection? We're trying, um, yeah. So it, it's part of that um, process. Um, we'd love to work with uh, the DEP. Um, EPA turned out that um, through CMU, we had better contacts at the EPA to start with. Um, and you know we, we're taking these things one at a time. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. on but the, but you agenda. definitely you know made a lot of progress in a pretty short period of time, right? Thanks to your with your help. So, but yes, we we think we're getting somewhere. Um, the EPA agrees that this is something that needs to be addressed. As with any government agency, they they've got a lot of priorities. Um, we're we're pushing hard, and they they're being receptive to to getting this reasonably high on that list of things that should be addressed. There seems to be no reason. Nobody has found a reason why this shouldn't happen. And, uh, you know, as a general question, how did you become interested in this technology and this kind of work? It was a little bit random, actually. Um, my sister lives in the Philippines, runs a home for street kids, and they were getting a lot of uh, floods. And the monsoonal rain would sit in the water in, in Manila because of terrible drainage for weeks on end. They would go out and work with kids um, for a little while, but the water would get dirtier and dirtier. And... Uh, so we sort of said, well, how, how might we help? And the idea was to build robots that could, could drive around um, and either you know, deliver small amounts of supplies. The WHO um, designed a small package um, for use uh, you know, to deliver to someone or at least uh, allow Catherine to sort of go and work out what needed to be done um, without having to sort of tramp around in, in her boots and, and exposed to all that dirty water. Um, we did get over to the Philippines and try this out, and we've got some, some fun blog entries of, of driving around in, in monsoonal floodwaters. Um, we haven't, it's one of the interesting challenges with things like that. We haven't been able to find an economic model and the right funders um, to follow up on that. We, we were sort of disappointed um, when Haiti was going through some terrible cyclones. We got a call from the Haiti, Haitian government saying, can you come down and you know, try to help us work out where cholera is in the city so that we can we can move people out. We know we've got a cholera outbreak, but we don't know where that is in the water. But we haven't really yet been able to find a, an economic model to make that work. Um, that's what got us into this, and hopefully one day we get back to it, but I'm not sure when that'll be. 
Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, oh, sorry, we have one more question. Um, can you currently analyze for nitrogen, nitrate, ammonia, and phosphorus? We have not tested any of those. I believe there are sensors out there for some of those. Um, water sensors are changing dramatically. Um, as I said, one of the things that, that we claim, and possibly a little bit exaggerate, if there is a digital sensor for it, we can do it. Um, Certain nitrates, I believe there are digital sensors out there for. Uh, I know that we were talking to a company the other day that's doing some really cool stuff with heavy metals that hadn't been possible before with a digital sensor. Uh, ammonia, I do not believe there is, but, but I'd have to check. We, we're, we're, on this, we're very much driven by our customers. Um, uh, if someone asks us for a specific thing, we'll go out. We, we are actually co-located with another CMU spin-out that builds sensors. And uh, in the case of bromide, we, we had a customer requirement that they wanted to be able to measure bromide over large areas, very important in Pittsburgh. Uh, Sensevere built the sensor and, and we're integrating with the boat. So sometimes uh, things that can't be done can be done eventually. <laughs> okay, so uh, while folks, if there's any more last questions, uh, please go ahead and get them in uh, now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go over some of our final information, but we'll still answer questions <coughs> all the way to, to the end. Oh, but here's one more question. Uh, can you collect grab samples for analysis by third-party labs? Yes, so we um, we currently have that ability to, to grab. Um, we did it with a, a, a 30 mil test tube, so that that capability is sitting on the desk. Um, we, we know that some customers want bigger samples and we are working through that. Um, over the uh, summer, we're, we've got some engineers lined up to build an ability to grab sample at depth, which we currently do not have. At the moment, we're grab sampling physical samples um, only off the surface. Um, we, we understand there's a need to do that at depth, and we're, we're trying to do that. At the moment, so right now, 30 mils, um, we're working on a, a, a pump that would allow us to take 300 mils or something, um, and then probably in a year's time, um, ability at depth. Mm. Um, if you wanted to be a, an early uh, tester of that, we'll have prototypes of ability to sample at depth in the next few months, and we'd love to work with someone who who, uh, who wanted to you know help us test and prototype and, and get requirements for that. And so why don't you uh, uh, talk a little bit about that. So your, your email address is up there on the screen, mm -hmm. so if somebody's interested in working with you or talking to you more, is that the best way to reach you? Best way to reach me is by email, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, you work, you know, it sounds like all over the world, so presumably anywhere in the United States or the world, you're, you're willing to work with folks, right? Pretty much. We, we have um, ongoing discussions to do work in Italy, Japan, and China right now. So, uh, and, and I'm going down to Brazil to work in, uh, take a fleet of boats out in Sao Paulo in July. So. And, and what are you, you going to be doing there? So they, they're very uh, concerned about pollution. So there, there was some talk, I, I don't think we've got there yet, um, actually looking at their rowing and sea and sailing course for the um, Olympics. Um, government moves slowly, um, so we've got a pilot project down there working with two universities to, to actually take a, f a small fleet of boats down there um, and, and, and show what we can measure about the water. Um, we're hoping that turns into an ability to, to measure for, the, uh, for some of the Olympic events that, where they're concerned about the safety of the, of the water. Um, we did a little bit of measurement for the uh, Pittsburgh Triathlon. Um, it didn't quite work as we, as we would hope, but um, so we're going to go and develop that technology a little bit more for the Olympics, hopefully for the Olympics. Okay, great. Uh, so if you would like to receive uh, the monthly updates on our future webinars, events, and this Constitute News, uh, please sign up for our newsletter at uh, tinyurl.com slash scottnews. And you'll be informed uh, of all these different webinars as well as the many other events that we have here at Carnegie Mellon. You can also follow us at Twitter at CMU Energy. As a reminder, the video of this event will be posted on YouTube and the Constitute webpage. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for joining us and look forward to hearing from you next time. Thank you. Thank you.